everyone knows what to do. Everyone knows they should eat better. They should not eat like an asshole. They should move their body more. They should eat. Like, everyone knows what to do. But the problem is everything below the surface. It's literally like buying a house and the walls crack and they keep cracking. So you just keep painting over them and plastering them. But if the walls keep cracking, it's the foundation that's the problem. And it is always go inward. Your outside world is just a reflection of your inner state. What is a healthy approach to overcoming or preventing that self-sabotage from happening over and over and over? I really think sabotage is a two-part thing. It's um, identity and patterns. If you sabotage a lot, we need to look at your identity. Because you know, I could give you all the strategies ever, but if you don't change the foundation of who you are and the beliefs you have about yourself, it doesn't matter what strategies and tactics I show you. If you could only teach your clients one skill or habit that would have the single greatest impact on their health and quality of life, what would it be? Welcome back to the Taught Not Told podcast. I'm here with my great friend, Jared Hamilton, and uh, I came all the way out to Indiana, well, for one, for a wedding, but also, <laughs> also to see my friend Jared. And let me tell you, I've been looking forward to interviewing this guy for quite some time now. I've been listening to his podcast, Dieting from the Inside Out, and it's actually one of my favorites when it comes to the mental side of things. And honestly, his coaching has inspired me. And uh, not only that, but Jared's worked with literally, I believe, thousands of people. He's been doing this a whole a lot time. longer than me. And uh, honestly, I've always wanted to sit down, pick his brain, and to share with you guys some of the insight and some of the crazy stuff going on inside of his head. So uh, before we dive in, I want to know, I want to, I want him to share with you a little bit about himself, a little bit about his story. He's got a very unique story from like how dieting came into his life at a very young age. So Jared, I would love to hear just a little like snippet, maybe like a little spark notes version of like your story and what got you into coaching. Yeah, dude. Um, for, appreciate you having me on, dude. This is this is a dope studio you have. Dude, this is yeah, awesome, man. Your studio is <laughs> sick. I think the plant was the actually yeah, that's right. the sickest thing. That's we right. Added. The plant is the gangster. Anyway. Um, but no, so for me, man, coaching it was it all happened on accident. Every move in my career was uh, it was not necessarily planned and it was very much an accident, um, kind of like my birth. Um, <laughs> but Same. Let's, let's go. Um, but so what happened was I grew up, uh, the, the Cliff Notes version, uh, version is I grew up struggling with all the stuff myself. I was a fat kid, always um, struggled with, with weight loss, body image, all that stuff. Um, got given a weight, a weight Watchers book when I was about 11. So I'm like 11 year olds, 11, 12, trying to count points and because that's what my family did. And I'm just like, I don't know, and all that stuff. Crazy. So that's where that shit started for me. And then um, and then basically um, did the whole trendy dieting thing for however long. And because um, I didn't know what I was doing, I was just like, carb store fat, you shouldn't eat food or eat fruit while you're driving. And like, mm -hmm. that was like an actual thing I read. I'm like, you shouldn't eat apples while you drive because it stores fat. So a lot of that nonsense and whatnot. And then <clears throat> um, when I was about 15, found the gym, found a bunch of meatheads, um, fell in love with lifting, but then, um, because it was a bunch of meatheads, um, it was more diet culture dogma. It was a lot of the same kind of nonsense, but I got in the gym, started getting, getting around that kind of community. Um, still struggled with like, with my own stuff. And then, um, when it came time to go to college, well, mind you, right before this, I, um, then I started to get my shit together and, and finally started to understand all this. And then right around college was when I started coaching people, started as a personal trainer, didn't really do anything with nutrition, only like I was just a trainer excuse me. And then, um, and then I built a in-person training business. I was working for like three different gyms and then while I was building my own thing. And then I ended up building a personal training business. And then, um, I became, well then after that, then I started to take the business online. Um, and then I became known as the sustainable weight loss guy. Like there was no depth to it. It was just sustainable weight loss. That was mm -hmm. my, that was my thing. I just showed people how to eat donuts, drink wine and lose weight. And that was pretty much it. But then one thing led to another, and then that's when the inner game stuff started coming into place where um, I noticed, and this is where it shifted, <clears throat> because at this time I had been running the business for a while. I'd been coaching people for years. I um, already started to like, uh, delegate, and I had staff and all this stuff. But then it was I noticed a pattern. I go, well, I can't do the weight loss stuff with people yet. People want to come into the program, and I'm ready to, to do the fat loss stuff. But then I'm like, well, fuck, Mrs. Jones has identity issues and it's causing her to sabotage. Yep. So we'll go, okay, fuck, I, I know I can't get her to lose weight until I fix that. Okay, let me fix her identity real quick and I'll get back on track with weight loss. Or someone else would come in and they had a relationship with food problem or binge eating issues or emotional eating or whatever. And I go, cool, ah, fuck, we can't go into weight loss yet. Yep. I got to fix this stuff first fix that stuff first. And then, okay, we're good with weight loss now. Um, because I knew I couldn't do the weight loss stuff that I wanted to do until I fixed their inner game. I never talked about this in my marketing though, but mind you, 
during this whole time, about my 20s, I've been into these kind of books and studying psychology and personal development, all for my own selfish reasons. Just I wanted to understand how the brain works and human behavior works and all that. Um, I never thought it would come true in this side of things either. But that's when it kind of started to evolve is it wasn't necessarily something I talk about or wanted to even do, but I couldn't do the thing that these people were paying me for, which is to cause a transformation until I fixed the underlying problems that were going on. So I would just, because of what I learned in personal development psychology, I'm like, cool, I can fix it real quick. Little transformation, change their mindset, change their beliefs, change the relationship with themselves. Boom. We're ready for fat loss. Um, and then it realized, I realized I go, wow, this is mainstream. Everyone struggles with this stuff. And right around then is when I transitioned to, and I started using the term dieting from the inside out. Cause that came out in conversation a lot. That wasn't just like a marketing ploy. Um, I was, I actually had a mentor of mine was t asking me about my business. And I go, well, I'm, we're actually talking about what I say to people. And then I go, well, I basically tell them I have to diet you from the inside out before I diet you for real. And they go, there's something there. Gold. Right. So I stuck with the, the dieting from the inside out. Cause it's also kind of self-explanatory. Um, but that's my motto is we have to diet from the inside out before we diet for real. So that's kind of the cliff notes version. That was phenomenal. And <laughs> so that, that actually is one of the things I wanted to touch on. And that was like one of the first questions I was thinking about was, I love the dieting from the inside out podcast. And I know that that's actually one of the first steps you actually take your clients through. And I've always been curious of like what that looks like from an actionable perspective. Like what does the process look like for dieting from the inside out, the mental game? Like what are the main maybe couple things that you are focused on or that you uh, educate around or teach to your clients in that first initial <laughs> phase? Because number one, selfishly, I believe that this is something I could work on with myself, my clients, because I too have noticed this where like, uh, for coming from like an engineering background in the early days of my college career, everything was like numbers. And it was like, mm -hmm. okay, if you hit this goal with this protein, you hit this number with your calories, like, but there's, there was something missing. And it was like that little detail of like the inner game, the self-sabotage, like you touched on. And that's always been something that I want to improve on to help my clients level up. And so um, from that perspective, what what does the first phase of your program look like from a actionable uh, perspective? Yeah. So for context, for those listening, when I work with someone, everything comes down to three stages. Stage one, we call dieting from the inside out. Once we check all those boxes, now we can go into stage two. We call it boring fat loss, which is it's just the normal fat loss phase. Stage three, we call maintenance mastery, where that's where you actually graduate coaching or you um, don't, or we, we teach you how to keep go, go through life with your newfound results and that kind of thing. Now the, the dieting from the inside out though, cause that's a common question I get from participants and they're like, okay, how does that even work? Because the, the, the first step is, is expectations. Number one is it's literally worthless giving you the fat loss results you want. If I don't diet you from the inside out first, one of the most, like one of the biggest questions I ask people, I go, cool. So if I could just snap my fingers and 50 pounds loses, like disappears right now, genie style, like magic genie from Aladdin, is it, is, is it gone for good? And they go, oh, well, no. I go, okay, well, that's the problem. Because if you just admitted magic genie powers does not take away your weight loss issues, then why are we trying to white knuckle through weight loss right now? Right? If I could literally go, boof, it's gone. All the weight that you're trying to lose is gone. It's not staying off. Okay. Then we got to, we got, well, then why? Oh, your relationship with food is bad, causing mm -hmm. you to binge eat. Oh, you self-sabotage unconsciously, so you fall off every weekend. Oh, you binge eat every other day because you have a bad day at work and you don't know how to regulate your emotions separately from food. The, the list goes on. So <clears throat> so for me, those are all the things. Because if you can't say, I, yes, it would, it would stay off forever, then we got groundwork to do. And I would go so far to say if you say, yes, it will stay off forever, then I go, then why is it not off right now? And they go, Oh, I don't know. And that's usually there's something else under the surface we're not seeing. So this is why in my head, this is where it's really nuanced because everyone's dieting from the inside out journey isn't the same. Everyone's issues are different. 100%. Um, just like with building a house, everyone's found, depending on what kind of house you have, everyone's foundation is going to be different, but you have to have it. We all can agree on that. So for me, um, I almost have a checklist in my head, like of all these issues that I talk about, like your relationship with food, your relationship with, with yourself, binge eating, emotional eating, sabotaging, knowing what to do, but not doing it consistent, all these things, we just have to have check boxes. Like I'm yeah. such a, from a simplicity side, I'm such a checkbox guy, yeah. right? So if you, we can check all these boxes, then cool. We can move on to the next level. But if you can't say, yes, my relationship with food is fantastic. No, I don't binge eat anymore. I don't sabotage anymore. Um, I know what to do and I show up for myself when I'm not motivated. Like all these deeper things, then we're good. Now you can go into the boring fat loss phase. But 
as far as like the getting a little bit more tactical around like what do I start someone with? It's the uh, it's what has the greatest ROI and what has the least amount of friction and what's the main, mo- the, the biggest problem right now. So for example, um, for most people, it's it's what's going to have the greatest impact right now because if someone has what I call a combo platter. They have all the things. Well, what's the most prevalent right now? Because most people get caught up in, well, where do I start with? Where do I go? At this point, it doesn't matter. Pick one. Like put them all on a wall and throw a dart and see which it hits. It, it doesn't really matter because mm-hmm. um, we're going to have to get through them all anyway. You know, if like I have to bring right now in this room, I have a desk, one chair, two chair, and a third office chair. Well, which should I bring in first? It doesn't matter. They all got to come in here. So if you have these seven issues causing all your problems, what should I start with? Like you got to get through them all. It doesn't really matter. Um, the only time that the caveat is, well, what's the problem right now? So, so for most people, it's their relationship with food because their relationship with food causes binge eating. It causes overwhelm around food. It makes date night a living nightmare. So a lot of times that's one of the first spots, but some people, it may be identity because um, our subconscious actions are always in alignment with who we think we are. So it just depends on who the person is, but there's literally like a checkbox list in my head of all of these inner game issues. And we just start going down the list and that's it. That's phenomenal. And so one of the like big buzzwords I feel like is being becoming more popular. It's been being used and thrown around like crazy. Like it's candy is, is relationship with food. I feel like that's like a big common buzzword relationship with food, this relationship with food, that. And so how would you define relationship with food or how would you describe that to someone? And what would be like the, maybe a pillar or two of like what, what it looks like to have a healthy relationship. And, and so on the, other side, like what is an unhealthy relationship with sure. food look like? So the way I compare it is think of your relationship with food is similar to a relationship with per- a person. There are times it may ebb and flow. Um, it's not crystal clear. It's not clean cut. Um, and there can sometimes be baggage. And when there is baggage, we need to have sometimes boundaries. We need to have more boundaries, less boundaries. As you heal through that relationship and things get better, you can bring walls down. It's so much like a relationship with a person. It's not even funny. Um, the way that I think about it, though, because some of these things are harder to define, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say when it comes to a relationship, like if I were to say, how would you, how would someone define a, a relationship with a person? Well, it's how you act around them, your thoughts around them, your beliefs around them, the emotional side of things. Like there's a lot of facets. So when I teach someone how to fix their relationship with food, I actually just did a podcast on this yesterday. We have to think about our words. We have to think about our meanings. We have to think about our beliefs. We have to think about our actions definitions if, that you give to those foods. Right. Yeah. If, well, because if we, because if you think about it, if you, um, if whatever it is, if I have the right words I use around, mm-hmm. around, let's say food, um, if I have the right beliefs around food, I forgot that one, um, words, beliefs, meanings, emo- meanings, emotions in a similar camp and actions. If those are all good, you're going to have a fantastic relationship with food. And if I have someone that I'm working with who has a poor relationship with food, I got to figure out which it is because they all also intertwine because if your words it's like the old saying goes, if you lie to yourself long enough, you'll eventually believe it. And our words dictate a lot of the meanings and emotions we have. My wife is the greatest human ever, but, and I, I, I either call her Shelby or baby. Those are the two words I'll, I'll like, Hey baby, will you get me this? Or Hey Shelby, whatever. If I don't change anything about our life, but I just use the word bitch instead, it's just a word, just a label. Instead of saying, Hey, I, yesterday I said, Hey, Sh- Hey Shelby, will you hand me a diet Pepsi out of the fridge? No issues there. But if I said, Hey bitch, will you hand me the diet Pepsi out of the fridge? Okay, we get, it's it, quite a bit different, right? Because now it's going to change yeah. the, it's not just the words, but it's going to change the meaning and the, the emotions. And we act subconsciously on our emotions. So it, it, they all trickle down to each other. But when I'm looking at someone's relationship with food, I'm looking at what words are they using? I am looking at what beliefs they have. Like if you actually think you look at bread and store fat, like imagine if I said, I look at you and I just hate my life. We're going to have issues in our relationship, right? If I like, I think of it this way. Um, if someone were to look at their, a person and imagine if you talk to the, another person, like you talk about food, you're the cause of all my anxiety. I can't control myself when I'm around you. I'm either all in or all out with you. You cause me so much grief. And once I start, I can't stop. And you literally only cause hell in my life. That's a lot to mm-hmm. unpack if that was a person. But if it's with food, it's, just, it's literally the same thing. So we have to go through the list. What are the words you're using? What are your beliefs around the thing? Um, what are your meanings and associations and emotions with the thing? And then the biggest one that dictates all of it are your actions. Yeah. I can, I can have the, I can say all the right things. I can believe all the right things, but if I avoid bread, like the plague, I will have a bad relationship with bread mm-hmm. as corny as that sounds. Um, but because we, because of what we've learned from childhood, a lot of times we have subconscious actions around food. A lot of people were brought in the, like the clean the plate club or the once I start, I can't stop or, oh, these foods are only treats. So a lot yep. of people have what's called subconscious restriction. 
People say all the time, Jared, I literally don't, I listen to every word you say. I don't believe any food's bad, but I still can't quit binging. I go, how often do you have the cookie then? And they go, oh, I, I don't because there's a subconscious restriction is because somewhere deep in your head is you still believe cookies are only meant for the weekends and you wonder why you eat the whole sleeve of Oreos. So this is why we have to approach it a little bit differently, not just from the conscious side, but from the subconscious side as well. So that is exactly where I wanted this to go. And I'm so <laughs> stoked. I'm so stoked that you ended right there because that is one of the, the next few things that I feel like ends up becoming a roadblock on, on a lot of people's journey, especially clients that I've worked with that I've like especially looking back like three to five years ago on the people that I feel like I let down because I wasn't in the place on my journey of coaching to help them at this level, which is the inner work. It's the inner game. It's the subconscious programming that we get from our childhood. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that's really where the the most biggest um, transformative um, actions take place is really reprogramming that subconscious mind. And one thing, one topic that I've heard you talk about um, that I've always been curious to know how you approach is like the inner work and that um, that inner child uh, or, or being able to uh, approach and, and work on that inner child. And so I want to know, like, what does that actually look like? What, what is the subconscious reprogramming that inner child work really look like? And how would you, how do you approach that with clients? There's a lot. Um, this is a, this is, there's a lot. And there, we kind of, I would separate these a little bit. Um, cause yes, part of inner child work with this stuff is subconscious work, but a lot of subconscious work is, um, is, is a pattern thing. So when it comes to subconscious stuff, that's, it's quite literally that it's subconscious. You are not aware you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for most people, they, they don't understand that the mind gravitates to it's like, it's proven by psychology, the mind and our nervous system gravitate to what's most familiar. So what you've been doing for the longest time, but I always talk about like to simplify inner work for most people is two parts It's new information and really uncomfortable action that goes in opposition of your old conditioning. As in, for example, let's say if it's with food, let's say you were brought up and you always feel that um, chocolate is bad. Chocolate's bad. It's a treat. We don't have it often and it stores fat and I'm uncontrolled around chocolate. Okay. We need to have a new belief and new information around, okay, here's why chocolate's not bad. Here's why you can have it in moderation. Here's why it's not a treat. It's, you can literally have it as many times as in the week as you want. But then the hardest part is the uncomfortable action going against the old conditioning. It's the same reason why information isn't enough. If someone's scared of heights, I can give you all the logistics why jumping out of a plane is going to be perfectly safe. You have a, it's all, all the things, but it doesn't matter. Your brain views it as I'm going to die. So that's the thing people don't understand is when it comes to a lot of this work, your brain is just about self-preservation. It's not about happiness. Your brain doesn't care about your results. Your brain mm-hmm. doesn't care if you're happy. Your brain doesn't want you to die. It's like the lizard brain. It's the old, more evolutionary side of you that's like, I don't care about anything else but self-preservation. Well, <clears throat> the problem is it, it will keep you in a reality that you don't like because it feels familiar. It's why people go back to old shitty relationships. It's why homeless people who find a million dollars go back to being homeless. It's why um, most people gain their weight back. It's, it's because we gravitate to what's most familiar because the brain and nervous system feel like it's safest because it knows what to predict and all these things. So with subconscious work, it's new information around the truth, the truth behind the stuff that most people were brought up incorrectly with. But then the second part is the uncomfortable action. Cause we can't just stay in thinking the same shit without changing action, and expect to move forward. So let's say with food, that would be like, I have a client right now. She is scared shitless of chocolate. And her biggest reason for working with me is to fix her relationship with food. I literally have it in her program to seven days a week. She eats hundred calories of chocolate because it's terrifying for her. But because we have to get the brain acclimated to a new reality, but this goes against the old conditioning. She would much rather eat 800 calories a day, work out every day, than me eat literally 100 calories of chocolate every day. But that's what it's going to take for her because it's not just new information. Here's why chocolate's not bad, but it's uncomfortable action in opposition of the old conditioning. We can only find what we enable. If we enable restriction, we find restriction. Mm-hmm. You cannot find freedom and enable chaos. We only find what we enable. So we have to ask ourselves, what actions am I enabling or what am I enabling in my actions? And that's why I'm finding the same shitty results. Um, so the inner child part though, is cause there's, there's so many levels of subconscious stuff. The inner child stuff is, um, you can actually do what it's called inner child work and go in and like basically give yourself the permission and, and talk to your inner child mm-hmm. as if they were in the room with you. So a lot of times this is where people get really kooky. They're like, I don't know what you're smoking, Jared, but this is kind of weird. Can I pause you for yeah, a moment? Yeah, for sure. Just because I, I want to touch on one thing with the subconscious. And 
the with the subconscious side of things, it, it just to kind of summarize what you said, which I, it was really resonated with me, was like <clears throat> essentially, and you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but essentially it's like find the scariest thing, which is like maybe like that your fear is chocolate. It's like I'm afraid that I, when I eat it, I'm just going to go binge on a shit ton of it. Or that's the one thing that I it's been programmed in my mind to be evil, like the, the, the devil. Right. But if you focus on including that and improve the fact that I can still move towards my, you know, light, move towards my goal while still including that, it's going to help heal that relationship. Or is there more to go along with that subconscious programming along with that? It, it's it's it's. It's both. Okay. Um, the, the way that I like to word it is, well, I, I can't take credit for this. Actually, it's ironically, it's in this book right here. Um, Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about when it comes to subconscious work is you have to become consciously aware of your subconscious self. Okay. You cannot escape a jail you don't know you're trapped in. So because the problem with things being subconscious is you're not aware they're there. Right. When I say subconscious restriction, you don't realize you're restricting. If I say I subconsciously get my volume up and I start talking really loud, I wasn't aware of that right? You can't fix what you aren't, you aren't aware of. Because here's the thing. Most people don't real, most people think they are the problem. It's not true. Your pattern's the problem. Mm. Because uh, I think it's Tony Robbins that says it, where if you think you're the problem, you'll never fix it because your brain won't let you self-destruct. Because if we, if you're the problem and we get rid of the problem, that means we get rid of you and your brain won't let that happen because of self-preservation. You're fine. You're great. You're perfect. Your pattern's the problem. Let's fix the pattern. Your subconscious is the problem. Let's fix that. Because that also takes away guilt. That also takes away shame. That also takes away, what's wrong with me? It's like, no, you're good. It's this pattern that you learned when you were six and defenseless and that someone else put in you and that you were just doing the best you did as a child and that's why you started binge eating or you thought chocolate was bad and you've just been wearing the equivalent of six-year-old clothes your whole life. Take off the clothes. You're fine. That's going to be a dope clip. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. Dude. See, and, and just so you guys know, this is exactly why I wanted you on the <laughs> podcast. Um, and, and you are absolutely silly not to have a notepad out, taking notes right now, because I know so many of you struggle with these things. That subconscious programming, you struggle with uh, having these relationships with food. And this next part is what I'm really excited to dive into as well, because this is something that I really want to be able to integrate into my coaching as well, which is the, the inner work, that inner child work. And so just to kind of go back into that, like, what does that look like or what are the the main um, ideas and things that people you find that struggle with inner work and like how how do you approach that in, in general? So because there's there's lots of inner work, but but you're wanting to talk about specifically inner child work. Yeah, because m the biggest thing I've noticed is that number one, people are again, it's subconscious in a way of like unaware of like where these these bad relationships come from or why every time the, the cookies on the counter, they have to go crush the entire thing. They can't just go grab one, move on with their day and continue doing what they were doing. Um, it's like, I feel like a lot of that oftentimes is rooting from like maybe scarcity of it in their household mm -hmm. or you're afraid that their brother is going to go eat all of them. So they need to go eat them all before someone else does. Yeah. Um, these are really common scenarios. I'll have someone do inner child work. Now, here's the thing. This is, this is, um, when, when I'm having a, uh, doing, having a client do inner child work, I'm not unpacking this with them. If someone needs this to be unpacked with them, that's more of the role of a therapist. Yes. Um, but there, but I work with a lot of therapists. I love a lot of people with clinical psych degrees coming into my program and things like that. And the thing is with all of this is there's an old saying is to heal the man, you must heal the little boy to heal the woman. You must heal the little girl. And whether anyone wants to admit it or not, we all have an inner child in us, or to be honest, a lot of us may have several inner children. Um, this is called parts work. You have different parts of you or versions of yourself. Um, <clears throat> and so for me, um, I'm actually doing a lot of really heavy inner child work in therapy right now myself with some other stuff, not related to fitness or food at all, but there's a, uh, there's a very hurt 13 year old. Jared, there's a, actually I have a, that's why I have a picture of the exact version of myself. So my therapist is actually doing guided meditations with me it's, I literally feel like I'm tripping on something. Like I feel like when I, like I'm on Mars when she has me doing these, but she's facilitating them where I'm actually in my head having a conversation with the equivalent of 13 year old Jared. And it is healing. It is heavy. It is a lot. So you can do in a weird way, the same similar, a very similar approach to with yourself. So, cause at, at the end of the day, the way that I preface it with people, cause we don't want this to be overwhelming. It's heavy. It's awkward. It's weird. Mm -hmm. So we want to make this really tactical. And the way I start with people is this, I go, cool. 
whenever someone's saying like, let's say, let's, uh, let's take the, uh, the big brother thing where it's like, Hey, I can't eat unless I have to smash my food really fast and eat all of it. Cause I may not get any more because my, I live with four other older brothers and they eat all the food. Okay, cool. Um, are you living with him right now? Well, no, you're an adult. You're, 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 you're like, you're, you're your own successful person or whatever. Go, okay, cool. <clears throat> so when did all this happen? Well, when I was probably six, where I would eat or when I would have to eat all the food inside because my brothers would eat it all and I wouldn't have enough and I'd be hungry. I'd be like, cool. So we need to take the judgment away from being uncontrolled because that was a six-year-old surviving. It's why we don't get too upset when children throw temper tantrums because they're, they're, they're two. It's what two-year-olds do. They throw temper tantrums because they don't know how to regulate. So we can't, this is my problem when it's like people are like, no, I'm not this weak piece of shit. Da, 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 I'm better than this. And it's like, okay, there's time for the ambitious side, but there's also, we need to get some love on this because mm -hmm. you literally have a six-year-old you're trying to ambition through this. It's not how it works. Um, I used to be that version where it's like, I'm better than this. No, crush the old self. No, your old self is probably 13. That needs some fucking love. That needs to be seen. That needs to be validated. That needs to be told everything's going to be okay. Like when I'm literally doing the inner child work with my therapist, like the one thing she's helped me with is I got to bring a lot of love and grace to this. Cause I want to like, st I originally wanted to be like, I'm better than this. Stop the old self be better than actually there's a 13 year old that just needs loved on that. What well, didn't get what he needed. So, but here's the cool thing in psychology, you can give them what they needed. It's what they call reparenting where you can be the parent you didn't have. You can be, give yourself the permission, the validation, the support, the whatever that you did not get when you needed it. And that's where this gets really powerful. So the way that I start to help people with this, I go, cool. If I could, let's just say I could pull some magic right now and I could put you in the same room with that version of yourself. Would you have words? And every person goes, well, fuck, absolutely. I go, okay, you can actually do it. Because like, if you said, Jared, I want to put you in the same room, a room just like this, this with the 13 year old version of yourself. Would you, would you have some stuff to say? I'd be like, yeah, I, I would, I have some stuff to talk to that little kid about. And I, so it's like, cool. What, what do you think you'd say? And you need to have those conversations. Um, now there's a few ways I like to prompt it. Um, cause I don't want to prompt it too much, but like, for example, with a person, let's say with this, the, with the, the brothers eating all the food stuff mm -hmm. is what would you tell her? Let's just say it's her right now. And say, wait, well, she doesn't, well, you're an adult. So we, you don't have to do that anymore. Oh, okay. So you're, re you're, you're releasing her of her duties. And then also, I, I like to go through this. I like to number one, thank them for keeping you alive. We need to start this with gratitude because whatever bad behavior you're struggling with, it started because of a good intention. You were just fucking six. And I have a, I have a really good story at the end of this specific part that, that I think will wrap, will, will really tie a knot, a knot in this well. Um, you were trying to survive, doing the best that you could as a six, seven, eight, 13, whatever year old. So you need to thank them. Hey, you did the best you could. It's like when a, a four-year-old brings you an ugly ass drawing that they worked really hard on. They're four. It's going to be ugly, but they, they did their best and you should be grateful for it. Thank them. Number two, release them of their duties. Hey, look, I want, I appreciate for what you did. Thank you for keeping us safe and alive with the best that you could. I'm so proud of you. It's you're literally put it, put, close your eyes and think about you're literally talking to a six-year-old. And then thank you for keeping us alive. I want to let you know you are officially relieved of your duties. I'm a big boy now. I'm a big girl now. You'd be so proud of where we're at. You wouldn't believe where things are at right now. And I want to let you know, I've got it from here. You don't have to, you do not have to protect me anymore. Most people get emotional right around here. That means you're healing. That means some breakthroughs happening. Yes. And then if there's anything left in there, say it as in like, Hey, I know mom and dad were crazy. I, I, I'm sorry. It was not fair what they did to you. It was not fair. You felt this way. It was not fair. They treated you this way. Um, and almost thinking of it, thinking of it like, what do they need right now? That's something my therapist talks about me with, with the inner child work. She goes, what's he need right now? What's he need to hear? And I was in the middle of this heavy inner child session, like eyes closed, tears streaming. And I'm like on Mars with my 13 year old self. And in my case, and specifically, she goes, what's he need to hear? And I go that it's all going to be okay. That was all I needed to hear. So I, in my head was able to tell that to my 13 year old self and it did something or whatever it is. And you, and, the, and you can go back and do this work over and over again and, and things like that. But like, that's kind of the order of operations is thank them for keeping you alive, relieve them of their duties and whatever else you want to say, if you could put them in the same room and then do that periodically, especially when triggered, especially when these things yes. come up. Um, and that's kind of where I like to start. So, but a lot of times I'll have someone do it in a journal fashion. 
A lot of times it's a lot to sit and visualize and all this stuff. So I, I started with an inner child letter. Write the letter if you could write it to your inner child. Hey, thank you for keeping us alive. Excuse me. Um, relieve them of their duties, whatever else you want to say. Put it in a letter and don't. And you can just throw the letter away. You don't have to do anything with it. So yeah. Or 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 even you could take that letter and every time something or because. Obviously, it's not going to be one and done. I wrote the letter. I forgave him. I gave him the love. And it's like, oh, I'm freaking great and healed, right? I'm sure there's going to be moments still over time uh, as, as time goes on where like, oh, this this is, keeps coming up again. And so would that be a good time to like, have that folded up somewhere safe where you go and read it to, again sure. to kind of like re reignite that passion you have for that 13-year-old boy or girl. Yeah. I mean, you could, I think it'd be a good time to do another one. Cause it's like, okay. um, because you're a higher level version now coming to it. Okay. You know what I mean? It's like, <clears throat> it's, it's newfound perspective, maybe right, 100%. Like what that kid needs in that moment that you're 13 yeah. year old. I mean, self. our perspective shifts watching a movie twice in a row. That's so true. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Let alone like you do it again. It's like, there's, this might be this other thing that came now. Cause mm -hmm. every time you do this, you're raising your personal vibration. You're raising your awareness. Um, Collect, like all, all across the board. So there's going to be things that you, that you didn't think about or things that you would word it word differently. It's just like, if we watch a, uh, if you and I, as like 30 year olds watch a movie from when we were a kid, we didn't see all the sexual innuendos where it was like, Oh, that wait, I never thought about the Rugrats doctor name being lip shits. That's fucking weird. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't see that as a kid, but we're adults now. So we know like, Oh, that's a kind of an innuendo. It's the same thing here is when you're, you're a lower level version of you when you're writing this letter, and if it comes back, you're now a higher level. So you're going to see things from a different perspective. So amazing. I'm still, I'm still like, uh, absorbing all that information. <laughs> Cause like literally this is, this is one of the main reasons I wanted to go down this rabbit hole is because I feel like this is one of the skills that I have not fully grasped yet that I really want to fully understand and be able to eventually teach and, and help my clients with, because um, I do have a handful that are in, in a similar position where like, no matter, you know, how well we're doing with our numbers in a sense, right there, there's always something that is subconsciously holding sure. them back and, or a trigger that happens that sets them off. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the only way to truly gain the successful path or to get on the successful path and to stay on it forever is to be aware of those subconscious behaviors, be aware of that relationship you have with uh, the sleeve of cookies, right? And so uh, I think the the one other thing that I think has really been um, impactful that I've listened to on your podcast that I think, again, you're, you're just an amazing communicator around is, is a self-sabotage. And I think the sabotage side of things of like this reoccurring thing where, you know, maybe it's a month in or maybe it's three months in, clients just have this automatic trigger of like, I got to stop this or, or I'm going to go sabotage it. And so I kind of want to dive into a little bit of that self-sabotage side of things and like a couple of like the main triggers that you find or what, what is, what is the biggest cause of self-sabotage and what is a healthy approach to overcoming or preventing that self-sabotage from happening over and over and over. I really think sabotage is a two-part thing. It's um, identity and patterns because half the reason we sabotage is because it's in alignment with who we think we are. As in, if you have an identity of I'm not good enough or I'm, I'm too far gone or I'm too old or um, I've always been this way, well, now you're getting results that go in opposition of that identity. So it's no wonder you fall off, right? If my identity is I'm a binger, now, I don't just binge eat. I'm a binger. That's a noun. That's not a verb. I'm a binger. Well, I go three weeks without binge eating. The brain's all about self-preservation, right? So now the now that now that identity's threatened. So I find a reason to binge. Or here, the, one of the big ones is um, how many times has someone said I'm not consistent? They get consistent for a month. Well, something has to happen now. You have to sabotage it because it's your the the identity of I'm not consistent mm -hmm. is threatened. And the, the, there's an interesting relationship between your identity and subconscious mind. It's like a mother bear. It guards it. So if your identity is threatened, your mother, your your subconscious does whatever it needs to do to bring it back to its where it's setting. Think of think of your identity like the thermostat on the wall. So let's say if my house is set at 70 and I leave the door open on a sunny day, the room heats up to 80, the thermostat notices the fluctuation, turns on, cools the room back off to its regulated temperature that it's set at. 
So if your temperature is your self-image, your story, your beliefs about yourself, your who you think you are, your identity of I'm not good enough, I'm a dieter, I've always struggled, I'm too far gone, whatever it may be, and you get great results, doesn't matter. It's why something always happens and cools the room back off to where you're set. That's why most people gain weight back to where they started exactly. And it's interesting. So mm-hmm. that's the first part is if you sabotage a lot, we need to look at your identity because you know, I could give you all the strategies ever, but if you don't change the foundation of who you are and the beliefs you have about yourself, it doesn't matter what strategies and tactics I show you. So we need to make sure, and we can go on an identity rabbit hole if you want, but that's the first step is the first part is identity. Um, because our actions subconsciously align with who we think we are mm. because we have 90, 85, 90% of our day is the, is subconscious. You're on autopilot all the time. Yeah. So what's it, what's our autopilot to in alignment with it is who you think you are. So that's why we need to check that first. So, so with the identity, one thing that I've picked up on is like with my in-person clients, I can pick up on this language like really quickly of like, they say, I'm this way. Like, whoa, are you, you're putting a label on yourself. Like, stop that. We got it. We got to shift that. We got to say, no, I can do this or I'm not that person anymore. You know, and you got to say it out loud, I feel like. And so when it comes to the identity work of like, I'm not around my online clients that much and in person, right? And so like, I don't know the conversations they're having with themselves or with their family or with their friends. And so how... How would you help them even be aware of their own habits and patterns when it comes to identity work? Because I feel like that's a that's a challenge for me, at least in this position I'm in right now, where like I have like a fraction of my business in person, which those people um, this I can pick up on quickly. Mm-hmm. But for the online, it's a little bit harder because I'm not having those specific conversations as much. Sure. I mean, but even with your in-person clients, you're not with them every day, every other or every True. second of the day. True. Let's say they have a session with you every day, which probably mm-hmm. isn't even the case. There's the other 23 hours of the day you're not with them. Absolutely. Right? <clears throat> so it's number one. Tell them like, hey, you're going to think like this. Hey, this is what's going to happen. So giving them the information and the tactics, but also correct it when it does happen. The reason in in in-person training, it's so easy is because you're right there. So when it comes up, you can go, hang on. But it's the same, but online, there's still a level of communication, a check-in, whether it be a phone call or a text message or an email, um, any level of communication, you got to flag it. I had a client the other day. She said something about, I'm doing great at incorporating junk foods into my diet. Like you said, I go, pause. She used the word junk food. So that tells me her labels around food are off. So we had, so I responded to her, um, about why we got to be careful with our labels, right? So because it was a com- she was communicating. So it's any lot of time the client communicates is you just got to be aware of it, whether it be in-person, phone call, Zoom call, check-in, text message, email, doesn't matter, so. Okay, and so of course we can be the person to uh, facilitate that like awareness and, and point it out. How do you help them become of their, aware of like their own pattern of that, of say like, Obviously, in the, the first phase, probably a little more hands on, a little more like, hey, you know, call them out on it. But I'm sure as they get towards like that middle in the end phase, like yeah, they go through the boring fat loss, I believe is phase two. And then they go into like the lifestyle mastery side of things. How do they prevent themselves from going back into those cycles and those loops in that final phase? Of we, so so this clients? is the uh, this is the, the the other part when I said sabotage is identity and patterns. This is when we have to do the pattern work, because the thing is the cool thing, the, the, the dope thing with sabotage is it has a red come a breadcrumb trail because every I actually just did this with a, a new client. Um, uh, on a, on a call the other day where she goes, I'm, I need help with this part. Cause she, I have, I have some coursework that I have clients go through with some of this stuff to help reinforce things, but she wasn't fully understanding it. So we had a call and talked about it, but I, but the way I word it is sabotage is completely pattern driven. So the cool thing is it's, it's proven what you do, right? It's not random. It's very, you've done the same thing. <clears throat> so I would say number one is we need to get aware of the pattern. So I'll ask the person, I go, cool. The last 10 years you've tried to lose weight, you probably sabotage in the same five or 10 ways. What are they? Again, you can't escape a jail you don't know you're trapped in. So we have to become aware of our subconscious self. So what are the patterns that always happen? Because again, if 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 we can, if we know what's coming, we can anticipate and stop it. So what always happens? Is it you do well for a bit, but something about like 17 days in, you want to quit? Is it you do good until you lose motivation? Then you quit showing up. Is it you do good, but then you um, have kids and the husband and work and school, then you quit prioritizing yourself, and then you start to fall off. Is you just go from tracking to like rounding and then to fuck it? What is it? Everyone's different. This is the thing is um, there's a million ways people sabotage, but we need to get clear on well, what's your pattern? 
what's your common denominator of the, of the, the, the things that always happen. So that's step one, get aware, aware of it, write them down because now you can go, Oh, these are the top 10 things I do the last five years. I've tried to lose weight. This is the 10 ways I've sabotaged. Cool. The top ones, the, because it happens the same, the same way for most people. Number two, we need to do what I call play the, if this, then what game, if this happens, number one, then what are you going to do? write the plan. The worst thing someone can do is they wait till they're in the middle of sabotaging to decide what to do. It's the same reason, like an analogy I like to use is for why most parents have the sex, drugs, and peer pressure conversation with their kids before they need to. So they can anticipate, prepare and anticipate. So when the day comes, they're ready. You don't want your kid like, should I have these drugs? Should I go in the back of the car with this boy? Should I do? No, you don't want them to be in that moment then deciding because emotions are all over the place. Peer pressure is a thing. But you probably, most people listening that have kids probably have the conversation around the the dangers of like sex, drugs, and peer pressure before they go into middle school, before these things happen. So when when they do, because they know they're going to happen, the kid is ready and armed and can implement the strategy that the parents said, gave or gave them. Same thing here. So step one was get aware of your patterns. What happens? These are the top five to 10. Number two. If this, then what? Go through each one. If this happens, I lose motivation. I don't want to show up. Then what am I going to do? What would you do? And then fill in the blank. If this happens, I step on the scale and I want to quit. Then what are you going to do? Not quit because that's not who we are anymore, right? Whatever it is, go through the list and give yourself actual tactical information when each of these happens. In coaching, people like you and me do it for the client. Like we'll Mm -hmm. walk them through like, cool, here's what I want you to do when this happens. And then, so that's step one. Step two, step three is now we anticipate sabotage always comes back around. I always yeah. tell people it doesn't matter because, you know, big coach Jared's here or coach Tyler's here. It doesn't matter that sabotage is always going to come back around because it's a pattern. The only way to stop a pattern is get on the outside of it and break the pattern. So this is when we anticipate it when it's coming. First of all, this gives you so much power and it makes it so much easier. You, you know, you're not the problem 100%. anymore. You also see it coming. And so, and you have a plan ready. You're just waiting for this thing to come through the door. So you already are going to be so much more successful than the final part fight. It's here. I always view it like a, I never actually saw the movie, but I know the premise of it. Like the purge. You ever seen the purge movies? No. Um, you know, the premise of the purge. Yeah. Okay. So like, like murder, like all crime is legal for 24 hours. Mm-hmm. No one like goes, Oh, the purge is tonight. Well, that sucks. Everyone boards their house and they know it's coming. They know the date it's coming. They know what's going to happen and they know what's going to happen if they don't prepare. And so they prepare accordingly before it happens. They make sure their house is safe. Purge is over. They go back to normal life. Sabotage is the same way. Sabotage is, is, all right, this is coming. I never prioritize myself. I, I lose my motivation when I start to get bored or whatever it may be. You create the plan. If this happens, here's what I'm going to do. If this happens, here's what I'm going to do. If this happens, here's what I'm going to do. I know it's going to come. I can feel it's going to come. It's here. Fuck, what do I do? Oh, wait, what was the plan? Okay, number one. And you're going to be so much more successful. And if you aren't, you just get back on track. But this way, you are almost on the offense of sabotage. It is not random. It is not, um, Oh, I'm not meant to be successful with this. It's no, it's literally a pattern of how your brain operates and how your patterns operate. So this is how we have to go through it. Jared, it's a lot. (laughs) You you blow me away. dude. I'm dead serious. Like I, I'm not kidding you. I'm going to listen back to this myself probably about five times (laughs) to really absorb and really, really grasp these things. And, um, I can't thank you enough because I, I want you to know that this right here, this conversation that we just had uh, or still having, but I genuinely think that these are the things that I have been needing to work on myself with my clients and my abilities as a coach. And it's no wonder that not only you and your clients are so successful because of these conversations, these foundations that you set up and help them work through. And uh, that's honestly why I look up to you so much as a coach and this isn't me just trying to fluff you up or nothing but (laughs) I I genuinely mean that man I I think uh I've always been someone who's really taken a lot of pride in trying to invest in mentors and get surrounded and and get in the right rooms with the right people and I'm so thankful that our paths have crossed and uh I want to thank you so much for having me come in your home man and uh you know being an amazing host and everything and I think one thing that I've I've also seen lately, uh, I also know that one of the biggest things that you have going on is like you have some more transitions. You have a bunch of things going on with your business, and I'm not sure how much or what you are willing to to share at this point in time. But I'm curious, like, what is 
next for Jared? I know you've been doing this for a long time. I know you've worked with literally thousands of people. I know you are uh, the definition of growth minded. <laughs> you, you literally, all these books behind you, uh, you're in multiple different mentorships. You're always learning. And uh, that's something I really look up to as well. And so like, what, what is next? Like, what is this next, you know, what, what I know you're continuing to coach obviously, but like, what is, what is this evolution looking like right now in terms of <laughs> what you're doing? I appreciate that. Well, when's this airing? If you had to um, guess. Two, three weeks. So, uh, okay. Well, that's why, cause, um, cause, um, the next big thing is actually is probably about the time this is going to be airing. Um, I'll be opening up my coaching. My I have a very special coaching group and we're going to be doing cause recently for the past, I've been coaching for like 12 years, it's been a really long time. I've been an online coaching before it was cool to be an online coach. Right. And I built right. it like, but even before that, before that I built this in-person training business, all the things I've never not been a coaching teacher. Like I'm just, ne it's never not even before coaching. I was still a teacher with other things. Right. So, um, is, is I've just, I've changed directions of the business. Like we've talked about, um, instead of scaling one-on-one -on -one coaching and trying to help as many people in that capacity as we can, I just don't feel like that's the right fit anymore because one-on-one -on -one coaching for the way that I see it isn't accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, whether it be one um, price points, whether it be also just like at scale, like there's only one body, there's only one Jared, right. There's just a level of people. Like, and I don't want to only be able to help like a small group of people. So uh, I'm still going to be taking on like my personal roster of like VIP clients, but I want to make this concept of diving from the inside out more accessible to the masses mm -hmm. um, because I think this is truly where the change happens. And I feel like one of my gifts is being able to teach like this. It's why I love podcasts. It's why I love hosting webinars and workshops and speaking and things like that. And I feel like that's where I have a lot of untapped power. So I'm going to actually be opening up uh, for the first time ever uh, my coaching group. It's called the Diving from the Inside Out Collective. And, awesome, dude. <laughs> and, uh, and it's basically like, uh, I'm making it where it's, uh, where it, it's still an investment, but it's, it's much more affordable than one-on-one -on -one coaching for most people. Um, and it's, but it's accessible directly to me and my team. Um, and I've got basically going to have it where people can access all these frameworks. Like I need that sabotage thing, but I don't know what to do. Well, here it is. Uh, I need that binging thing, but I don't know what to do. Here it is. But then they also have access to myself, um, in the rest of the collective members that are going to be a higher caliber individuals. Um, but they're all getting led by me, but it's going to be taking this information more accessible to the masses. Um, so that's going to be opening up in like three weeks. So <laughs> talk about <laughs> the probably going to be the most powerful <laughs> it's gonna be great. and impactful community that I know in, I know of in the entire fitness community. So that's fucking amazing. I appreciate dude. that. Uh, I'm also in the middle of writing my book right now. Um, I, I signed with a publisher, so I'm right in the middle of writing the Dieting from the Inside Out book. Um, people ask me all the time, they're like, hey, where can I study this stuff to learn about? And I go, I don't know of a book, so I'll just write one. So I'm in the middle of writing the Dieting from the Inside Out book. Um, I, it's not secured right yet, yet, but I'm word on the street is I'm about this close to a TED Talk right now. So uh, yeah, so and it's going to be a Dieting from the Inside Out TED Talk. Um, I'm, I'm, I haven't secured it yet at the time of recording this, but I'm like, it's right there. Um, and then... Yeah, a lot of it, I do. I don't even know. There's just so many things going on. And I used to be in a, a place where I had to know everything, but that's me trying to take the known to the unknown. But I'm part of me is just like, we're just going to be here for what is. And I, all I know is it's going to be dope. That's all I know is it's going to be dope. So, yeah. Dude, that is so <laughs> cool, bro. Okay. So I think uh, I'm glad I got you on now before you're sure. mega famous with, <laughs> okay. your, with your TED Talk. <laughs> but uh, when you're back around with your book tour, uh, we'll have you back on Let's and talk go. about the book more in Let's depth. Go. That sounds freaking exciting. I can't wait to read that. Um, and one moment. I'm going to pull up my question. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh, wait, you had, you, so, you're doing that thing. Yeah, so I want to start a little tradition with the Taught Not Told podcast. And I want to, at the end of every podcast, ask one question. Uh-oh, no pressure. And your answer could be as long or short as you'd like. Okay. But I'm curious. If you could only, because it's taught, not told, and instead of telling our clients what to do, we like to teach them and help them educate and learn and, mm -hmm. and be able to really uh, integrate these things that they learn. And so my question is, is if you could only teach your clients one skill or habit that would have the single greatest impact on their health and quality of life, what would it be? Go inward. No doubt about it. Go inward is it's the epitome of my entire entire methodology and mission is you have to diet from the inside out before you diet for real. Everyone knows what to do. Everyone knows they should eat better. They should not eat like an asshole. They should move their body more. They should eat like, everyone knows what to do. But the problem is everything below the surface. It's literally like buying a house and the walls crack 
and they keep cracking. So you just keep painting over them and plastering them. But if the walls keep cracking, it's the foundation that's the problem. And it is always go inward. Your outside world is just a reflection of your inner state and your inner stuff, whether it be your mindset, your beliefs, your vibration, your childhood, it doesn't matter. Your world, outer world is, world is a mirror, is a mirror of what's going on internally. Actually, I never told anyone this. That's what this is about. That's why I like this necklace I wear every day. This little, like, looks like a little black mirror is because it's my personal reminder that if something's going on out here in the outer world with me, I have to go, what's going on on the inside? Is it a belief? Is it a, is it an energy? Is it a, is it a, uh, something I'm not working through enough in therapy? Whatever it may be is everything outside is a reflection of what's going on on the inside. So we need to look where it actually matters and go inward. Jared, I can't tell you how I, this may be, I won't say impossible, but this is probably going to be extremely challenging to top this interview. I, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to have a hard time finding some guests okay. that will be able to top this, but, uh, man, I, I can't thank you enough again, seriously, like for being such an amazing host and having me in your home. Uh, also with this cool setup we put together course, and everything, right. but, uh, uh, I want, I'm sure people after listening to this are going to be like, well, I need to, I need to connect with this guy. I need, I need, so, uh, I have two things. Um, number one, where can people find you? What, what is the best way to connect with you? Uh, and also I need you all to do me a favor, go shoot this man a follow on whatever platform <laughs> he has, uh, or that he talks about and please send him a message and, t- and thank him for, for coming on and sharing all this amazing information. I appreciate that, man. This is also a testament to you too, because most coaches don't talk about this stuff. They don't want to. Most coaches d- don't have the desire to teach this stuff themselves. This is stuff no one wants to touch with a 10 foot pole. So the fact that you're literally coming on a camera saying, this is what I want to get better at. So I'm getting the best people that I know how to, that's a testament to you and how good of a coach you are. So appreciate you guys are in the right hands, like listening to Tyler. And, um, so for me, <clears throat> uh, if you want to, my show is called dieting from the inside out. Like it's kind of so, yes. self-explanatory at this point. Um, it's on all platforms and YouTube, uh, I hang out on Instagram and TikTok at, at real Jared Hamilton. Um, and I answer all my DMS. So yeah, it'll also be in the description, but Jared, thank you again, bro. I really thank appreciate you, man. You. I appreciate and this. We'll do this again sometime. 100%. This is so fucking 100%, 100%. great. 100%. 100%. Appreciate you, bro. Love you, dude. Love you too.